Aren't you glad you don't have to stand when the rabbi talks? I was just going to say, we were standing. <laughs> well, we all know about the leaked brief this week, leaked from uh, the pen of Justice Alito. And we know that one in four women in America will have an abortion at some time in their lives. And I think we're pretty certain that if men got pregnant, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Justice Sonia Sotomayor repeatedly in the arguments before the court, when the arguments were taking place, stated that the opinion that states may make abortion illegal really is, can only be based on a religious argument, the argument that life begins at birth. And so doctors and prospective mothers are guilty of murder. And she kept pushing the idea of this, that it's really about religion. And so, it's, it, and so we shouldn't pretend that it's about other things in terms of this distinction, does life begin at birth? And I felt that she was ignored. There is no other argument available she, she presented. And she said, this is similar to LGBTQ marriage. Because if there is no harm to anyone in these two cases, and there is no other legal principle at stake, then we arrive at a situation where the court would be allowing states to impose one religious view on the population at the expense of their rights. And I believe she was exactly right. There are, however, two aspects to the freedom of religious of expression at stake here. And it's my purpose today to try hopefully with not arrogance when I know that I'm a um, cisgender man and also without the arrogance that I know more Torah or Talmud than the rest of you. So I just wanna share the Talmud that I, that I dwell on at this time. So I think there are two aspects of religion here and they need to be distinguished. One is the issue of religious coercion where one group imposes their religious view again, which otherwise do not, does not connect to non-religious legal principles on another. And we have seen this with LGBTQ marriage. In today's Torah portion, we have the second of the two biblical mentions of the prohibition of two men behaving intimately. One religious authority, a fundamentalist one, may say that this biblical line means that gay marriage needs to remain illegal. Another legal authority, let's say that of our denomination, traditional conservative Judaism, sees the context of the mention as crucial, the context read from the Torah today and last week. Given that there was no institution of gay marriage at the time, there was no way for such relationships to be kosher. And the text is concerned in this context that such behavior will be seen as not counting as real intimacy. Given that we have the possibility of sanctified legal marriages for LGBTQ partners, the prohibition does not apply to them. So the issue of religion and American legal consideration of LGBTQ marriage is whether one religious authority gets to impose its interpretation on others, on the rest of us. So it's not about religion versus not religion. It's like your interpretation of Talmud is better than mine. I have a very strong view here and so why should your authority be the church that rules over my church, let alone my state? And certainly the issue of abortion includes the same religious dimension. How one set of authorities wishes to impose its view not only on the secular populace, but also on other religious authorities, church against church. But the issue of abortion includes another religious dimension that's getting lost in the discussion today, and I believe it's equally important. It's about the religious life, the spiritual life of the prospective mother. And I'd like to show you how. I think our traditional Jewish texts leave us in a very important position, a position of an important silence, not speaking for the prospective mother, but honoring the depth of spiritual and religious life that she holds, her relationship with God, now the Talmudic texts I'm gonna share do not come with trigger warnings, so I'm going to add some here. They are clinical, not because, it's not as simple as well, it's men talking. They're clinical about other things too. But it's because the Talmud is like a law school class 
where very specific cases and hypotheticals are put forward to tease out the logical, moral, and spiritual implications of various positions. So I want you to consider this accordingly. So obviously I'm speaking of abortion. I'm gonna soften things as much as I can say. I understand that that is a, a topic that one may not wish to hear on this day and in this moment, especially after this week. And so no one would be disrespecting me or Torah to, um, to disconnect either physically or mentally. So I want you to consider where I think the texts are going and be informed in my opinion. The most famous line that the rabbis dwell on is many of you already know is from Exodus 21 verses 22 and 23. And it says, if there is an accidental miscarriage because two men are fighting and they knock into a pregnant woman and she miscarries. And then it says, but there is no further harm. Velo ye ason, anoshi anish. If there is no further harm, then there is a fine. Compensation is due to that woman, to that family. But because only there's only capital, um, there's only death penalty in the case of murder. So if two men are fighting, they knock into a, a pregnant woman, she miscarries, it's not an act of murder. But the verse continues and it says, if there is no further harm, well, I'm sorry, but if there is further harm, then it's a capital case. It is life for life. Now, we in our Jewish tradition, following Rashi and the others, we understand that to be further harm to the woman, right? She miscarries, but there's no further harm the, the, the judge, the court, will determine the, um, the amount of money that she's due to try to make it right. But they don't kill the man. But he could be liable to the death penalty if there was further harm. Now, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, which became very important in early Christianity, doesn't translate it that way. They say, if there is further harm to it, then you shall give life for life. And they put in specifically, if it is fully formed, then it is life for life. So the it is not the woman, which Jewish tradition says it is, but is somehow referring to the fetus. So if it's a miscarriage, but it is further harmed, it is fully formed, their life for life. And so this influenced the early church greatly, this translation, and thus we've come to the position that people associate with religion saying that abortion is murder and that life begins at the time of conception. So if the woman dies in Judaism, it's a capital crime. But the Septuagint, the early church, if the baby dies, it's a capital crime. I don't know how else the miscarriage would produce, but we'll leave it at that. The Talmud addresses this, Masechet Sanhedrin, where it says that basically ask the question, when does life begin? It says, if a woman was giving birth and her life is endangered by the fetus, the fetus may be sacrificed in order to save its mother, unless its head has already emerged. And then it is now a life and one life cannot be pushed aside for another. Rashi actually gives us the traditional interpretation of this, which is maybe it's even that the midwife, it's not men doing it by the way, that the midwife is required to perform a surgical abortion, which it describes, and I will not quote that part because it's graphic, that the midwife is required to carry out a surgical abortion if the head does not emerge, because the life of the mother is paramount, even if she says, please don't do it, I'd rather die. So it establishes clearly that a life for life begins when the head emerges from the womb. And the rabbis, as you know, like to carry on pages and pages of conversation. So they carry on pages and pages of conversation of what exactly emerging from the womb down to the millimeter would look like, and I'll happily spare you that discussion. But that is the entire discussion. In a different tract of the Talmud, Masachet Arachin, the question comes up. Now, this is a hypothetical, I believe. What if you have a pregnant woman on death row? Do you delay the execution? The Mishnah says, in the case, in such a case, the court does not wait until she gives birth to do the death penalty execution. Again, I wanna remind you, I mean, if you're me, you're thinking, this is really too much. Assume you're in a law school class 
and we're carrying on hypotheticals. You're arguing your case in speech and debate. And the Mishnah says, um, you do not wait unless the woman is already in labor. The Talmud asks, why did the Mishnah even bring this up? Isn't it obvious that the court executes the pregnant woman without waiting? After all, the fetus is part of her body. And then the Gemara answers, it was necessary to even point it out, even though all of us should find this obvious, because the father may say it's up to him and it's his decision. Consequently, the Mishnah teaches us that the court does not take this factor into account. In other words, the father does not have to say in this case. Now, I want to zero in on where this is going and ending. The relationship of a woman, a prospective mother, between her and God. In, so you might want to say, okay, I happen to know from the Talmud that it says in several places that, quote, until the 40th day from the moment of conception, the, and I'll call it the embryo instead of the fetus, the embryo has the legal status of water. In which case Jewish tradition says, and I think this is without debate, that um, medication or a morning after pill within the first 40 days is entirely kosher. And it's not even immoral, unless you wanna talk about all all um, all contraception being immoral. So unless you want to have discussion that all oh, we're, we're supposed to be fruitful and multiplied, so otherwise within the 40 days, there's no immorality, there's no issue. But if you want to say, but Rabbi, didn't you just say between 40 days and labor? What's the status? And then the tradition starts to leave it open. And it says, you know what? It's not a nothing, but it's not necessarily a something either. It's in an intermediate state. For example, beyond the 40th day, um, a woman should consider it something more than her period. And beyond the 80th day in tractate Nida, the woman considers it one step beyond, one step beyond having her period. But we know there's a big in-between. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi holds a fetus is considered as a part of the woman's body. And it is as though the master transferred ownership of one of her limbs to her. The master has designated, this is yours. I'm almost at the end here. So at this point, do we stop and we say, what is growing inside a woman's womb is, is a nothing. It's like water. Well, we didn't say that after 40 days. Well, okay. Somewhere after 80 days, isn't it close? It's just a part of the woman's body. I think the Talmud is calling us to something deeper here. The master has transferred this decision to the mother, not to the husband, not to the court, certainly not to men and one woman trying to decide for the rest of us or her. But they open up that this is a sacred bestowal of responsibility on the mother. It's not a nothing decision. And so I quote, interesting section from Sanhedrin. A non-Jew approaches Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and says, when do you think the soul enters into a person? Is it at the moment of conception? Is it at the moment of the formation of the embryo? How about after your designation of 40 days? And Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said to him, well, in some ways you could say it's from the formation of the embryo. And the non-Jew replied, eh, are you really not willing to go far to say that this is a life and a soul from the beginning? And Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said, you know, there is some indication of support from that view if you quote from Job, but we have a different view. But there's some support for that view. I would say there's some support for a woman who holds that view. So where we end is this, what I feel is missing from the discussion so often is 
prospective mother has a decision to make. And I don't think her head should be filled with voices of people who say, this is nothing. Don't even think twice about it. I certainly don't think her voice should be filled with heads, um, voices that say you're committing murder and doing a terrible thing. But I do think she should be told, you have a journey to take in this decision. And your view, your values, your conversation with God at this time is what God is bestowing upon you, not a preordained decision from any of us. One of the reasons I love Planned Parenthood is because people forget that their mission is not just to do medical procedures, it's to counsel. It's to help people find out who they are. Mother, prospective mothers reflecting so that they can make their own decision. A decision that is a freedom of religion, not freedom of listening to a particular religious authority, the freedom to have your own relationship with God and make her own spiritual and religious freedom of choice. Shabbat Shalom. We continue with the closing prayers of Musaf. We're on page 155. Please rise.